The Card Counter by Paul Schrader stars Oscar Isaac as a person who counts cards. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, I'm a little hesitant to actually give details before going into it because pretty much anything about the plot is a spoiler just because the plot is um, quite simple but doled out very slowly. And a lot of the movie focuses on the confounding, minute, interpersonal reactions and ways of merely just living that calls into question why and for what purpose. So, yeah, don't watch. I mean, if you want my assessment of the film, it, if you like strange interactions you know paul schrader writes interactions between individuals to this day as uniquely interesting as taxi driver um i believe he wrote that film in raging bull so if you're into strange interactions between characters that have a lot of depth to them that isn't spoken on the surface then just go watch the film. Otherwise, uh, sit down because we're going to go over it. So the film starts and Oscar Isaac is at a card table. And before that, I have to say the like pre-movie credit sprawl of like the actors and like the 85 executive producers that this movie has looks like it was made in kid pics. Like the font that they chose just looks laughably unprofessional. I don't know. It just that part looked fucking silly to me very odd anyway the movie starts and we're at a close-up of a like a poker table or a card table where you gamble at i don't know shit about card games so i apologize if i use the wrong card game terminology anyway he's explaining how to count cards he's talking about like you know shifting this number thing of like a plus you know and like you count how many cards are left in the pool of decks and blah 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 and so like you're you're heavily baited in the beginning of the film to believe that this is going to be a movie where maybe the audience is going to get educated enough or will be able to understand what's happening at the end in this like climactic scene of some kind of gambling high stakes gambling thing right um and that's where the movie sweeps you under the leg it got gotcha. you it's not about gambling gambling is just a smoke screen the name card counter is merely a smoke screen it it isn't about gambling at all i will say i mean maybe thematically the gambling ties in but i haven't really made that connection yet sorry i'm not the smartest person alive to be able to do that but what is the film really about so back to the introduction oscar isaac explains how to count cards and then we see like some like uh, casino officials coming up behind him and he's like okay i'm done and and we find out that he only won like 750 bucks. So like, why would the casino be like, you know, you're counting cards, you need to come with us. Like the main character, he's a little, he's a little suspicious of these places. He plays for low stakes. He's quite good. And then he just moves on. And then he moves on to a hotel. Um, he goes in and the first thing he does is he takes the pictures off the wall. And Paul Schrader does that classic Paul Schrader thing where he keeps the camera still while there's some shit going on and characters walking in and off screen. So you're a little, you're like, what, what is going on here? But uh, yeah, Oscar Isaac like basically strips the room of any kind of personality. Not that the decor of a, of a hotel is anything to you know, write home about. But he takes all the shit off the walls and he ties everything in this like white linen cloth. Like everything is covered as if you were like fumigating or like dusting your home or something. Like everything is covered in white cloth. The tables, all that shit. So you're like, what the fuck is happening? Um, and then he like goes to bed and then he goes to the next town and he, he does a little gambling and then he sees that there's like some secu security expo. Um, and he goes there and then Willem Dafoe is doing a presentation on lie detection software. And you're like, okay. The, immediately what I thought is, okay, you have a high profile actor in this other role and you have our lead character, Oscar Isaac, who sought out the security expo probably by, by design. He probably wanted to go see, the, see him. And then we have the camera 
profiling our two soon-to-be lead characters, Oscar Isaac, sitting in the chair during the presentation, and dweeby-looking 22-year-old, like, stoner bro with curly hair. Um, if you saw uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer, you remember that actor who was, like, the dweeby guy who was, like, putting the family through hell? He's kind of like that, but, like, grown up and, like, has, like, a, a big neck. <laughs> That's the main main character trait of this character. Anyway, they're both sitting there watching it, and immediately what pops into my head is... One of these characters wants revenge on Willem Dafoe's character. That's that's it. That's good. There's got to be some history there, right? Because nothing that's going to happen is going to be more interesting than the motivations behind what is what has happened. The story is more interesting than the plot, is what I'm saying. So the plot is what the film shows us. The story is the parts of the film that were not shown but are implied to have happened. And some of the story is shown to us becoming plot, but it happens so far in the past that it's like not even a part of the film's plot. Um, so we'll get into that. So the curly-haired kid like gives Oscar Isaac his phone number, and you think maybe this is some gay meetup, you don't know what's going on, you know, whatever. And then Oscar Isaac goes to bed and we get one of the strangest sequences in the film. So mind you, up until this point, everything has been shot very clean. We are in a very pristine environment. Oscar Isaac has told us about his 10 or so years in prison. He believed that he wouldn't, be very, he wouldn't do well in prison, that he was afraid of small spaces as a child. Um, but in prison, he became well acclimated and blah de blah de blah And... And... Then we get this dream PTSD flashback where the camera lens that was chosen basically makes it seem like as the camera pushes forward, like imagine you're going down a hall and the camera is pushing forward. The way the lens is, it's essentially like imagine like an X-Man visor for like Cyclops and it like goes all the way to the side in the front of your head. So that's how the camera lens like is capturing the picture. It's incredibly wide. And as you're pushing down the hallway, the parts that are to the left and right seem like they're like peeling off the screen and they're going to the side. So it creates this like tearing visual imagery. Um, and that matches very well with what's being shown because essentially we're at a prison camp where people are being tortured. Like if you remember the Abu Ghraib or whatever it was called, like basically um, some American soldiers were like just horrifically torturing and like, you know, taking just horribly demeaning pictures with these like, um, like torture prisoners. I'm not sure the context um, like the torture prisoners are all naked and then the, the soldiers that are like torturing them and everything are like, you know, taking like, you know, gun finger poses with them, like bang, like it's just really disgusting and dehumanizing and, and it's horrific. And basically Oscar Isaac, he was a military police at this prison who like enacted these tortures. And in this sequence, we got like a guy covered in shit running around like a dog. We got like naked dudes everywhere, just people everywhere. It's, it's, and they're blasting crazy screamo music. So it it just it just is, is a nightmare. It is it is visual anxiety. It is uncomfortable. Um so Oscar Isaac has that PTSD and then he like calls um dweeby curly hair boy. Um he's he's not a boy, he's he's like twenty two or twenty four probably. Um but he just his character is presented as like immature and like he has one goal. So they meet up and curly haired guys like, you know, I know who you are. You know, my dad was there in the, in the prison, but only the people that were on camera got punished. The, the superiors, none of those people got punished. Like I want to punish, you know, uh, fucking, uh, I, I can't remember the actor's name. Willem, Willem Dafoe. Dweeby here guy wants to punish Willem Dafoe <laughs> because he was a superior and he also trained Oscar Isaac's character in how to like do the torturing. And now that guy, he's like doing consultation for like this lie detection software or whatever. And so Dweeby here guy, he's like, my dad beat me. My mom left one day, didn't say anything. My dad committed suicide. Like, um, 
you know, I got debts. I'm just going to go fucking kill this guy. Whatever. That's all I care about. And Oscar Isaac basically says like, uh, okay, let's go along. Like, I, you know, I go to these places and I do gambling, you know, come along with me. I'll pay for it. I'll pay your way. So we get this very awkward team of dweeby guy who doesn't really have much to do. Um, and then Oscar Isaac, who's like, basically you can tell right away, like Oscar Isaac probably doesn't want to do revenge. Like he's, he did eight years in prison. Like he doesn't want revenge. He just wants to kind of like live a very meager life and then die. I don't know. But when he meets this dweeby kid, he finds like something to do more for. So prior there was a, um, uh, a black lady who kind of courted Oscar Isaac and, and she basically runs this stable of gamblers um, where these backers fund the money for them to gamble with. And then, you know, the, the backers get like, you know, half the earnings or whatever. Right. And at first he's like, Hey, you know, I don't want to do that. I, I do small stakes, you know, blah, 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 stay under the radar. And then, but now that Oscar Isaac has this new passion, a new aspiration of like, you know, kind of paying this kid's debts and giving him like another chance in life, um, he, you know, reaches out to her and he's like, yeah, I'd like to go on the, on the circuit. I like to, you know, get a backer, blah, blah, blah. Um, now mind you, this is all communicated in very sparse dialogue. So you have to kind of read between the lines of what's going on with the characters. Characters are not very oftenly expressing exactly how they feel. That only really happens in one scene near the end. And that's at the most emotionally wrenching scene. So Good execution there. Anyway, uh, the the kid, he like you can you you discover like he doesn't really have a good plan, and you know they they do some gambling. Um, the kid and Oscar Isaac like they both have severe social functioning problems. It seems like like Oscar Isaac wants him to go into the prison that he stayed at to go visit somebody. Uh, we don't see who Oscar Isaac visits, uh, which is interesting. But, like, he doesn't want to go, the, the kid doesn't want to go into the prison, and he refuses. And you can tell this is like, you know, you, you know he's paying your way, like, you kind of should do some of the weird shit that he wants you to do. Um, but the kid refuses. And then they, like, meet up, and they're talking at, like, a pool. And there's kind of this interesting just a, just a, pos, just a position, just a, I, I forget how to say that word. Um, but anyway... There's this interesting dynamic between, you know, you have Oscar Isaac and Dweeby Kid, and they're on one side of this pool, this hotel they're staying at, and they're having this, like, ridiculous conversation where, you know, they're, Oscar Isaac is mad at him about this one thing, you know, going into, the, going into the prison. And then on the other side of the pool, there's just, like, these two characters who are, like, chatting, um, like, normal people. And the camera frames them as like on in the beginning, you see the top of the pool and like, you know, they're, they're across the pool. You can see the distance. And then the camera swaps over and it's like you have Oscar Isaac and Dweeby Guy. And then between them, between the two chairs, you can see the other two couple people there. And I feel like there's some kind of like implication of like that this in your mind, the film is visually telling you that like, these characters are physically distant and they're not like romantically engaged, but the current conflict they're having is one of emotional intimacy um, that like Oscar Isaac wanted him to come into the prison with him. He wanted him to show him a place that he, you know, basically developed for eight years and he learned to count cards and he developed this whole different way of being and the little dweeby kid, you know, didn't want to go in there for X, Y, Z reasons that he comes to later discuss. And that kind of like puts a bit of a door closing on their relationship. And I think eventually the kid's like, oh, I'm going to leave. I'm just going to go do whatever. And then Oscar Isaac like takes him back to the hotel and he like sits him down and you think like, is he going to torture him? Cause he has this like bag of shit and he starts like, basically like he gives him some money. He's like, Oh, you know, this is, this is how much debts you have. This is where your mom lives. Like, I'm going to give you all this money. Um, you're going to call her and then you're going to go back to college and you're going to get your life on straight. And he does have him call his mom and the dweeby kid like agrees to this. So then everything's looking great. We got like 10 fucking minutes left in the movie, right? Like what can go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Right. 
So we get to the final table and Oscar Isaac is playing the game and, you know, there's down to three people and they have a 90 minute dinner break. So Oscar Isaac goes back up to his room. He's now in a relationship with that black lady I mentioned earlier and everything is going great. And Oscar Isaac's saying like, you know, he, he's expressing the things that he wasn't able to say to the dweeby kid that like, you know, he wants, you know, X, Y, Z thing for him, giving a new lease on life, you know, get, you know, getting rid of his debts, blah, 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 all that shit. And then we get a text. And the text is from the Dweeby Kid, and it's a picture of Willem Dafoe's house that we saw earlier in the movie. And it says, wish you were here. Oscar Isaac goes back, tries to play the last three people in the poker game or whatever it is. And he just gets up and says, uh, I, need, I need a break or something like that and leaves. And he goes back to like his hotel room and then he sees like on the news that you know, the kid, he, like, tried to shoot Willem Dafoe with, like, a BB gun, and Willem Dafoe shot back and just killed him. So, like, he's, like, dead. And then next we see this, like, pretty well-done, well-edited transition of, like, uh, Oscar Isaac is just driving to Willem Dafoe's house. Willem Dafoe comes home. Um, Oscar Isaac, like, has a gun trained on him. He's, like, the power's off. Like, he sits down. They have a little chat. You know, like, you trained me. And then uh, Willem Dafoe engages in... He's kind of a similar character to... Uh, uh, Boondock Saints, uh, where Willem Dafoe's response is, uh, that's pussified shit. Every man's responsible for themselves or whatever. And it's like, no, literally not in the military. Like, that's not how it works at all. Like, you are the responsibility of your platoon or whatever is the responsibility of the leader of that platoon, you know? Like, that, that, that there's a hierarchical nature of responsibility in the military, you know? Like, I, I'm sorry, but you're fucking objectively wrong and your own history should back that. But he's just saying, you know, whatever he needs to to escape out because he's, he's, a, he's a bitch. He is a bitch. <laughs> so he, they agree to some kind of weird torture game and they just go in the other room and Oscar Isaac's like, we're going to take turns until one of us dies. And then, and you think that like, oh, Oscar Isaac's just going to torture him and kill him and that's going to be the end of the movie, right? Um, but there's a problem with that is that if the movie just had Oscar Isaac like torture and kill Willem Dafoe and then go back to prison, like then the film is essentially saying that the political backdrop for the film of having these soldiers done this torturing, it's essentially saying like torture is good when it's used on the right people. And it's like implicitly, you know, saying that like despite the tragedy or the horrible inhumanization of what happened, it's okay if it's done on the right people. But the film doesn't do that. What the film does instead is Oscar Isaac says, we're going to take turns. So it equalizes the power differential between the two individuals. And seemingly they both torture each other until sunlight. And then Oscar Isaac walks out. He's got like a fucked up finger and he's like bleeding all over the place. So I guess they just took turns using various torture devices on each other until one of them just died. And then Oscar Isaac walks out and he you know, calls uh, 911, says there's a homicide, says the address, and then they come on over, and then he's back in prison, and the film starts the way it ended, which is, you know, he said, oh, I never thought I would be accustomed to prison, blah, 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 all those reasons, you know, being afraid of small spaces, and the film ends, and he's like, you know, I never thought I would be accustomed to prison or whatever, and he's back in prison, and it says he has a visitor, and he goes down to visitation, and it's that lady, it's that, 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 that woman, that was the stable person that he got into a relationship with. And they both like put their finger on the glass. Um, so yeah, strange film in terms of like meaningful plot. Cause the plot's pretty sparse, right? Like tried to get this kid back on the right track, but the kid, you know, wasn't able to, and the kid died doing what he doing something bad and pretty dumb. And then Oscar Isaac takes the final revenge and he takes his own revenge and he takes ownership of his revenge and he, and he, uh, goes to prison for it. Like he goes to prison for like a, uh, like a, like a mutually agreed upon almost kind of reason. Like Oscar Isaac and Willem Dafoe both like, you know, they're going to take turns, you know, torturing each other. Right. Whereas like previously Oscar Isaac's character was the fall guy for, the higher ups who were training and telling these, you know, soldiers to do these horrific tortures, you know, before he was the fall guy and he really wasn't at fault. Cause it's like, you, that's what, this is what you have to do. Right. Otherwise you're going to get like, you know, discharged from the military or whatever. So 
Whereas his first eight years in prison, that wasn't his fault. But this time it's like he did something of his own choosing. Um, and there wasn't like a power differential. I mean, there was a bit of a power differential because Oscar Isaac has a gun. But presumably after they engage in the torture that like, you know, he doesn't use the gun to keep threatening him. Because how would he hold the gun if he had his fingers all fucked up anyway? So like that was his like more freer choice, I suppose, um, as if that's a thing. So, yeah, the, a lot of the film is in, like, the editing, and the editing is quite interesting. A lot of the film is in, like, the intensity of the interactions, and that's pretty hard to convey in a review. But uh, if you like any of other Paul Trader's, like, written works, I, I would say give it a watch. But the plot is pretty almost weak. And it's very similar to First Reformed, if you've seen that, in terms of, like, the kind of narrative structure of, I I used to believe in this one thing, then thing happened to me, and then I became woke to the reality of the world. And in First Reformed, he wants, like, you know, he becomes, like, an eco-terrorist. Um, but in this film, he's, like, kind of more at peace, the main character. But then he, like... He gets pulled back into like, well, now I have to do something because the thing that I was living for is gone for me now. And I have my own kind of revenge that I also want to take that has now become activated. So interesting film. I would say one of the themes is revenge, but I'm not sure what it's really saying about it other than just like a, a total condemnation of... Uh, the military's history in terms of torture, which, uh, yes, fuck that. Uh, pretty bad. Don't, don't, uh, torture people. That's just like not going to get information. It's a waste of time and, and you're dumb for doing it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd say it's like a six or seven out of 10, just cause like the editing and I, and I like the awkward interactions, but in terms of like, I think for like the normal person probably wouldn't be that interesting of a film, unfortunately. And also, it seemed like the, I have to say this, but it seemed like the love interest lady, that, that female, it was like she was acting from a whole other movie. Like, her performance was so much different than the other characters. It was really bizarre. Uh, that was kind of strange. Um, but otherwise, I, I liked it a lot. I thought it was pretty neat. And uh, there's some interesting, like, editing choices in terms of, like, the kind of subtle PTSD that I think that's going on in the film. But you'd have to see the film to understand, so whatever. Anyway, blow me.